you were there in, uh, in Isaiah chapter 19, and we're continuing our study through the book of Isaiah. And uh, we, last week we did chapter 18, which was dealing with Ethiopia, but it was really uh, segueing into this chapter, I believe. And so in chapter 19 there, we see that it's called the burden of Egypt. Okay, so a lot of these you can see that, the, the burden of Damascus, the burden of Moab. And so uh, it tells you right off the bat who we're talking about. So there's no doubt that this chapter is about Egypt. Um, and what's interesting about this passage that we're going to see is that uh, it's talking about Egypt being judged, but it's not, it's interesting because they're, then they're going to be healed and then they're going to be serving the Lord. That's how it ends here. So it's actually a very interesting chapter um, as far as knowing that back in the Old Testament there was a time when Egypt was actually serving the Lord. Okay, I think it was a short period of time, okay, but there was actually a short period of time in the Old Testament before Judah was brought into captivity where Egypt was actually just serving the Lord and calling upon the name of the Lord and, you know, and, and all that. And so it's very interesting to see this little snippet in time that you don't normally see uh, when you're looking at the rest of the Bible. And so, but there in verse 1, let's start off there, it says, The burden of Egypt, behold, the Lord rideth upon a swift cloud, and shall come into Egypt. And the idols of Egypt shall be moved at his presence, and the heart of Egypt shall melt in the midst of it. So the first thing that I see here is the Lord riding upon a swift cloud. Okay, And this just screams to me, second coming of Christ. Okay, So uh, just to show you some verses on that, uh, go to uh, Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1, and a lot of these verses are very uh, familiar to you. But when you understand what's going on here, especially if you look at the, the end times application and the fact that this nation is going to be judged, but then it's going to be healed. And the idea of when Jesus comes back, he's judging the earth, but then he's healing it. And that's when you have the thousand year reign. And so this really does fit with that. Um, but he rideth upon a swift cloud, it says. And it says in verse 7 of Revelation chapter 1, it says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him, even so, amen. So it, it shouldn't marvel you that when he's coming, riding in on a, a swift cloud that there's all this destruction that's happening afterwards, right? Or this judgment that's going forth, because that's the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord for the saved is, is salvation. It's redemption. The day of the Lord for, uh, for the unsaved, it's destruction. You know, it's going to be mourning and weeping, okay? And so uh, it, it's, it's literally two extremes when it comes to who, who you are, whether you're a believer or an unbeliever at that time. Uh, Revelation chapter 14 and verse 14, so it says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. So this isn't a secret rapture, by the way. Uh, everybody's going to see this. And so uh, we don't believe in the pre-tribulation rapture here. And people are like, well, where's the rapture in Revelation? Well, Revelation 14 and verse 14, it says, And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a, a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And we see that he's reaping the earth, but then there's another angel that has a sharp sickle that's reaping, uh, you know, the vintage of the earth which is dealing with the wrath of God. Okay, so you had the rapture of the saved, but then you have the fact that he's basically taking all the unsaved and throwing them into the wine press of the wrath of God. And so, uh, so but you say, well, you know, a swift cloud, behold, I come quickly, right? The fact of how fast he's gonna come when he does come, it talks about uh, like the lightning goes from the east to the west. So, you know, when Jesus comes, it's gonna be a quick coming. And, it's, it, and it says a swift cloud. So I don't believe that's there by accident that is talking about the swift cloud. Uh, but Daniel chapter 7, go to Daniel chapter 7, just to show you this because I think this chapter really shows us here kind of a little snippet of the fact that he's going to come, he's going to destroy, and then he's going to heal. Okay, And that's really, if you want the overarching uh, ending, uh, you know, basically the book of Revelation, right, is the fact that he's going... You know, there's, there's great tribulation on the saints, but then when he comes, there's going to be destruction, plagues, all this stuff that's going on. And then at the end, he's healing the nations, and he's reigning for a thousand years. And ultimately, 
you know, there's a new heaven, new earth, and everything's healed, right? So, I mean, that's the end game as far as Revelation goes. Uh, but in uh, Daniel chapter 7, verse 13, it says this. It says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven. See a theme here? He cometh with clouds. He's sitting upon a white cloud. Uh, he's coming. He came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him, and there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations and languages, shall serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away in his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. That's obviously talking about the Lord Jesus Christ setting up his kingdom. And it's very clear that, hey, it's for all nations, it's for all people. You know, when the rapture happens, it talks about this. It says all kindreds, all tongues, nations, and people will be standing before the throne at that time, uh, you know, with white robes and palms in their hands. And so the idea is that everybody's going to be there. And every single person, that, as far as skin color, culture, all that stuff, there's going to be people that have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ out of all of that. And at the end of this chapter in Isaiah 19, it's really just showing you that, that, hey, even Egypt, there are people that are serving the Lord. And, you know, other nations are going to serve the Lord at that time. Um, but let's go back to Isaiah chapter 19, uh, and let's look at what's going on at that time, okay? So, obviously, this chapter here is dealing with a near-future application, something that's about to happen to that physical nation that's there at the time, uh, you know, when Israel was a nation and when, when Egypt was a, a powerful nation and all that. And so, notice what's happening here is civil war. Okay, so what God does here is he causes them to have a civil war. And a lot of times, um, that's how God works when he's judging uh, nations, is that he either lets them eat themselves, you know, and destroy themselves, or he'll send something in there to destroy them. Uh, but in verse 2 there, it says, And I will set the Egyptians against the, the Egyptians, and they shall fight every one against his brother and every one against his neighbor, city against city, and kingdom against kingdom. And the spirit of Egypt shall fail in the midst thereof, and I will destroy the counsel thereof, and they shall seek to the idols, and to the charmers, and to them that have familiar spirits, and to the wizards. So what do we have here? We have civil war that's going to break out in Egypt, and that's pretty much how it's going to go down. You know, they basically are going to kill each other, is how he's judging this nation. Okay, and notice what it says in verse 4 and going on here, and it really shows the judgment that's going to happen. Okay, so they basically kind of implode on each other, and then he's going to have this cruel, fierce king that's going to rule over them. Okay, now I don't really know who this king is, to be honest with you. Okay, um, I don't believe, and I'm going to show you why I don't believe this is when um, they're taken out by Babylon. Okay. Because later on, they're going to be taken out by Babylon and by Nebuchadnezzar. But I don't believe that that's what this is talking about right here. I, I personally believe that there's going to be the civil war, and then they're going to set up a king that's really bad. Okay? It's kind of like after all the dust settles, you know, who ends up rolling over them is like this really bad king. Okay? And so notice in verse 4 there, i got to turn this thing down. I'm just like, is it loud back there? I can just hear it like vibrating off the wall, like coming at me here. So I should have never messed with this thing. Can you hear me? Is it still still there? Okay, good. It's just a little too loud. It's just if I'm hearing it like in my ears, and I think it's a little too loud. So let's see how that works there. So So there, can you hear me? Is it still on? Okay. So let's read this, and it's going to go into the judgment that's all going on there. But notice what it says in verse 4. It says, And the Egyptians will I give over into the, land, or into the hand of a cruel lord, and a fierce king shall rule over them, said the Lord, the Lord of hosts. Now, this doesn't say it's a foreign king, right? It doesn't say that they were taken out. I think my battery's dying on this thing. So... Um, Brother Joseph, do you mind going into my office and getting a couple double A's there? This, 
it's going to be pieced together here. Um, the only reason I really care is because this does go back to the mother-baby room, so they can't hear me if I don't have this thing on. But I think the battery's dying on me. I think that's what's going on. So, um, yeah. I should have known that you have the batteries on it. Just two. Thanks. Well, I never said I was professional when it comes to this, okay? <laughs> All right. Should have known when it was blinking on me. So. All right, so we should have no interruptions there. But it doesn't say that it's a foreign king that's coming in here. Do you see that? It, it basically just says that he's going to, uh, he, I will give over into the, uh, Egypt, the Egyptians into the hand of a cruel lord and a fierce king. Okay, so that happens a lot when it just comes to any nation, right? I mean, you can think of our nation where, you know, he kind of gives it over to a cruel or a fierce leader, if you will. And so um, I believe that's a judgment, obviously, that's being put on them. But notice in verse 5 there, it says, And the water shall fail from the sea, and the rivers shall be wasted and dried up. And they shall turn the rivers far away, and the brooks of defense shall be emptied and dried up. The reeds and flags shall wither. The paper reeds by the brooks, by the mouth of the brooks, and everything sown by the brooks shall wither be driven away and be no more. The fishers also shall mourn, and all they that cast angle into the brook shall lament, and they that spread nets upon the waters shall languish. Moreover, they that work in fine flax, and they that weave networks shall be confounded, and they shall be broken in the purposes thereof, all that make sluices and ponds for fish. Surely the princes of Zoan are fools, and the counsel of the wise counselors of Pharaoh has become brutish. How, how say ye unto Pharaoh, I am the son of, of the wise, the son of ancient kings? Where are they? Where are thy wise men? And let them tell thee now, and let them know what the Lord of hosts hath purposed upon Egypt. The princes of Zoan are become fools. The princes of Noph are deceived. They have also seduced Egypt, even they that are the stay of the tribes thereof. Okay, so it's basically just the, the implosion, right? Basically, they have, they have this civil war, but then on top of that, God dries up all the rivers. Now, if you know Egypt, what is the main river, you know, when it comes to Egypt that everything is banking off of? You know, no pun intended, but uh, it's the Nile, right? I mean, you think of all, if you, and if you've ever studied, like, or looked into ancient Egyptian cities, but you just go down the Nile, and you'll see, like, uh, Thebes, and, uh, you know, Ramesses is a place, you know, and actually the Bible talks about Ramesses, you know, the city of Ramesses. And then, uh, you know, you think of Cairo and all that stuff that's up more north. But you have the sea, the Mediterranean Sea, that's on the north of Egypt, but then the river, the Nile, and there's other rivers too, but the Nile is the main river, if you, if you think about it, where er they live off that, okay? If they don't have the Nile, and even today, if you look at the Nile, it's the only place where anything's green, okay? So everything that has life is based off of that river, okay? And basically it's all dried up. And so that is a big problem with, because they don't have any fish, they, they don't, have, and not on top of that, even just working with flax and this, anything that they're doing, everything is just being completely annihilated. And, on, and, and also he's basically saying all the wise men, everybody's just being brutish. And what does brutish mean? It just means you ever hear somebody like, that guy's a brute. Well, it's kind of like, what I always think when I think of a brute is a big dumb animal, right? You know, just someone that's just, just kind of simple-minded. They're strong but simple-minded, right? But brutish is literally that. It's meaning like a simple-minded person, someone that's not smart, not intelligent, not wise, okay? And it's basically saying all their wise men, their wise counselors are all become brutish, okay? So they don't know what to do, okay? It's basically they're being deprived of wisdom at this time. So just everything is falling apart for Egypt at this point. 
And notice what it says in verse 14 because there's something that happens here that I believe is causing the, the men to basically lose all their wisdom. Okay? And this can happen in a country, you know, where a country, and, and listen, I, I feel like we're, we're living it, where people are literally becoming morons that are in high places. Okay? People that are supposed to be in Congress. I mean, there's a congressman, you know, this is years ago, but literally thought that Guam was like a lily pad that could flip over. And that guy's a congressman. He literally was talking to a general and was worried about having too many people on the island of Guam because he thought it would flip over. And I'm not joking, okay? Those are the type of people, you have people like AOC, right? Alexandria Cor Cortez or whatever her name is, you know? And just the, the stupidity that comes out, I mean, the Green New Deal. I mean, who here has talk, seen that? The only thing I remember is the one senator making fun of it, talking about how we're going to have to ride on tauntauns to get up to Alaska. Or we're going to ride big, giant seahorses to go from, to Hawaii. Okay? And, uh, but that was probably more intelligent. What that guy talked about with bipedal space lizards, that was more intelligent than AOC's Green Deal. And what I'm saying with this is that when, when a country gets wicked, when a country forgets God, it is turned down into hell. And one of the punishments that we see here with Egypt is the fact that wisdom is being taken away from them. They are literally becoming morons. And that's, that's, my, that's my definition of brutish, okay? And you're like, well, this is brutish, okay? But what's, what's the definition of brutish? Someone that's simple-minded. What's the definition of a moron? Someone that's simple-minded, okay? And so they're becoming fools, but look what happens here. In verse uh, 14 here, it kind of explains why this happens or how it happens. In verse 14, it says, The Lord hath mingled a perverse spirit in the midst thereof, and they have caused Egypt to err in every work thereof. As a drunken man staggereth in his vomit, neither shall there be any work for Egypt which, he, uh, which the head or tail, branch or rush, may do. It's basically saying they don't have anything to do. And what it's saying is that he mingled in a perverse spirit. That's very interesting because that reminds me of a story. Go to uh, 1 Kings chapter 22. 1 Kings chapter 22. 1 Kings chapter 22. And so I believe that verse 14 is really showing us how did he make them brutish? How did he make them basically be deprived of wisdom? Okay. Now, we saw earlier that they were consulting unto f those that have familiar spirits and the wizards, okay? And then we see here that the Lord hath mingled a perverse spirit in the midst thereof, okay? And this just reminds me of a story about King Ahab, okay? And go to 1 Kings chapter 22 and verse 20, and notice what it says here. And it says, The Lord said, Who shall persuade Ahab that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? Okay? Now, I believe God's in heaven here, and we'll see that, and I, I believe it's very clear that he's in heaven, and he's basically saying, who will go? It's kind of like when Isaiah in chapter 6, you know, it says, who will go for us? Talking, you know, because obviously God is the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. So the Trinity, they're saying, who will go for us? And Isaiah said, here am I, send me. And he said, go preach the reprobate doctrine. And that's what it is. That's, <laughs> that's what he told him to preach. You know, I know that it said, you know, people are like, oh, go be a missionary, and, you know, people need the Lord, but it said go preach the reprobate doctrine. Go preach to harden our hearts is what it, what it was. But the same thing here is that he's basically saying, who will go and cause Ahab to go into battle so that he'll die? That's what's being said here. Okay, now let's read on. It says, and one said on this manner, and another said on that manner, and there came forth a spirit. Now, that's interesting because it just says a spirit, okay? It doesn't say, like, what kind of spirit, okay? Because there's unclean spirits, and then there's, like, holy angels that are ministering spirits, okay? It just says a spirit, and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. And the Lord said unto him, wherewith? So basically, the spirit says, I'll do it. But he's like, you know, how, wherewith? You know, how are you going to do it? And he said, I will go forth. And I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, Thou shalt persuade him, and prevail also. Go forth and do so. 
Now therefore, behold, the Lord hath put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these thy, thy prophets, and the Lord hath spoken evil concerning thee. But Zedekiah, the son of Canaanah, went near and smote Micaiah on the cheek and said, Which way went the Spirit of the Lord from me to speak unto thee? And Micaiah said, Behold, thou shalt see in that day when thou shalt go into an inner chamber to hide thyself. And I didn't really need to read the rest of that, but I love that story. You know, Micaiah is basically prophesying, this is what the Lord said, and Zedekiah uh, smites him on the cheek and says, you know, which way went the Spirit of the Lord? And he said, you'll know when you're hiding yourself in the chamber. <laughs> you know, when you're, when you're hiding yourself from being killed, that's when you'll know. Um, so I love that story. But what's going on here, I believe, okay, now I just did a whole sermon on Job, okay, and what did we see in Job? We saw the sons of God presenting themselves before the Lord, saved people in heaven presenting themselves before the Lord, and who came among them? The devil. I also believe that the angels are there with them. You say, well, why do you believe that? Because the devil was cast out of heaven in, in chapter 12 of Revelation, and it says, and his angels were cast out with him. That means the same time the devil's cast out, the angels are cast out, his angels, you know, which is the, all the devils, right? So, meaning this is that I believe a devil's like, hey, I'll go persuade him. And God says, go do it. Just like God told the devil, you know, do it, just don't kill him, right? So God allowed it. And so this isn't, meaning this is that God can't lie, okay? And I don't believe that the angels of God that are, you know, not, that haven't left their first state, that haven't sinned, can't go down there and just tell a blatant lie. But the devils can. And what you see here, what I believe is happening, is that those false prophets were filled with devils, right? And they were prophesying lies. And God allowed that to happen because he wanted Ahab to die. Does that make sense? And in this passage, I believe the same thing is going on where he, he allowed this perverse spirit to, be, to enter into these wise men of Pharaoh. And that's why they were consulting unto wizards and those of familiar spirits, okay? And then that caused them to basically just implode, okay? Because if you don't have wisdom, if, you're, if, if our country just completely just became moronic, everything will fall apart, okay? And you see that happening today. I mean, where the fact where, we can't even figure out there's only two genders. You know, I mean, if we can't figure out there's two genders, I mean, we're falling off the wagon, okay? And just the, the stupidity, you know, the flat earth theories out there, you know? That, that alone should tell you that there's some stupidity that's roaming out in the world. And then just all the other stuff that's going around that it just should be common sense, but people don't, don't know anything about it. So. So all that to say is that, you know, it, it is a judgment from God, I believe, to basically be deprived of wisdom. And you know what the Bible talks about? There's an animal that's deprived of wisdom. It's the ostrich, okay? You know what the ostrich is known for, besides looking really ugly and stupid? Is putting its head in the sand, right? Someone that's deprived of wisdom doesn't foresee the evil coming and, and you know, hide it itself. You know, basically the ostriches, they see a car coming, they're like, put their head in the sand with their big rear end sticking out, thinking that they're not going to get run over, okay? And that's our country right now. Our country right now is just basically putting its head in the sand for killing 3,000 babies a day. Putting its head in the sand because it's promoting pedophilia, sodomy, wickedness, murder, all this garbage, and they think that they're not going to get destroyed for it. And you know what? God's depriving them of wisdom, of just understanding just simple truths like there's two genders, simple truths like a baby's a life. I mean, that should be common sense. You know, when a baby's hiccuping in their mother's stomach and kicking, and you can hear the heartbeat at eight weeks, that that is a life and that you're murdering that child. This isn't rocket science, okay? Although the doctors agree, and the Bible agrees, and it's only people that are selfish and wicked and sadistic that want to do this type of stuff. And so, yeah, I mean, I believe our country is being deprived of wisdom every day. I feel like every day I'm in the twilight zone seeing 
people talk about things and people in leadership positions that lack any type of wisdom and understanding. But I look at it as, well, it's a judgment from God. You know, our country deserves that. So it is what it is. Now, go back to Isaiah chapter 19. Isaiah chapter 19. And again, with, you know, with the, a lot of the stuff you could, you know, parallel to the end times as far as, you know, the, uh, a cruel and a fierce king was put over them. You can think of the Antichrist, you know, as far as the Antichrist takes over uh, the seven-headed dragon, if you will. And Egypt's one of those heads. And so you can definitely correlate this as far as, um, you know, that goes there. But um, now this is, I want to get into why I believe this is before Judah goes into captivity, okay? So I believe this is, as far as when this happens, I believe this happens before that, and then uh, the, I'll get into my reasons for that. Now, and, and uh, Isaiah 19, and verse 22, I'm kind of jumping down here. Um, in verse 22, it says, And the Lord shall smite Egypt, he shall smite and heal it, and they shall return even to the Lord, and he shall be entreated of them, and shall heal them. In that day shall there be a highway out of Egypt to Assyria, and the Assyrian shall come into Egypt, and the Egyptian into Assyria, and the Egyptian shall serve with the Assyrians. In that day shall Israel be the third with Egypt and with Assyria, even a blessing in the midst of the land, whom the Lord of hosts shall bless, saying, Blessed be Egypt my people, and Assyria the work of my hands, and Israel mine inheritance. Now, you can say, well, this is future. I believe this is, this is more so dealing with what exactly happened then, okay? Meaning that there was a time when Egypt, Assyria, and Israel were basically in harmony, okay? And notice that it says that Israel, in verse 24 there, Israel shall be the third with Egypt and Assyria, meaning that Assyria obviously is a superpower, right? And Egypt was the biggest superpower before that, but now Egypt's kind of fallen, you know, being knocked down a peg, right? That's what we're seeing in this chapter. But it's basically saying after this happens, after he heals Egypt, it's going to be Egypt, Assyria, and Israel's going to be the third, meaning that Israel is going to be the third most powerful nation in the world, okay? And we know that Assyria is, uh, you know, going to be the, the powerful nation. That's where... Hezekiah, you know, prays and is trying to take over the world, and, and, and Judah is the one place they haven't taken over. They take, in, they take over Egypt first, then they take over, like, other places, and they're trying to take out Judah, but they just can't. Um, but go to 2 Kings chapter 23, 2 Kings chapter 23, just to show you where I believe this, this timeline or where this would be at, I believe you're dealing in the times of Josiah, okay? That, that there's this, uh, you know, trifecta, if you will, of Assyria, Egypt, and Israel. Now, when it says Israel, I believe it's talking about Judah, okay? So, again, sometimes when the Bible's talking about Israel, it's talking about that southern kingdom. And even in the Bible, you know, in, in, in the New Testament, when it's talking about the house of Israel, the northern kingdom's not there anymore, right? So you're talking about, like, Judea and some people in Galilee, right? Some of, you know, those that, the Jews that live in Galilee, um, and then Samaria is like in between there, okay? So Israel, I believe, is talking about that because, late, because before this, it's talking about how they're going to fear in Judah, okay? So Judah is what's being mentioned as far as the Egyptians fearing those in Judah. But in 2 Kings chapter 23, this is dealing with Josiah and Pharaoh Necho, okay? So in verse 29, it says, In the days of Pharaoh Necho, king of Egypt, went up against the... Uh, I'm sorry, in his days, so in Josiah's days, Pharaoh Necho, king of Egypt, went up against the king of Assyria to the river Euphrates, and King Josiah went against him, and he slew him in, at Megiddo when he had seen him. Now, this is where Josiah dies, okay? And I meant to put this in there, but go to 2 Chronicles chapter 35. 2 Chronicles chapter 35. This is in my notes, but this is what I wanted you to see here. That... So basically, at this point, there's war that's going, breaking out between Egypt and Assyria. Now, when it's talking about Israel, Assyria, and Egypt basically being in harmony here, I believe this is before this happens with Pharaoh Necho, okay? So this is at the end of Josiah's reign, obviously, because he dies <laughs> in this battle, okay? But that being said, 
Um, before that, I believe during Josiah's reign, because Josiah was a great king who had revival, okay? And I believe during that time, Egypt, Assyria, and, and Judah were thriving, okay? There's this time of peace, if you will, and a time where Egypt was actually serving the Lord, okay? Believe it or not, this, there was a time. And <clears throat> notice in uh, chapter 35, so 2 Chronicles chapter 35, notice what it says in verse uh, 21 there. It says, but he sent ambassadors to him saying, what have I to do with thee? So Pharaoh Necho is sending ambassadors to Josiah. So Josiah is basically coming out to war against Pharaoh Necho. That's what we read in 2 Kings there. But it, so Pharaoh Necho sends ambassadors to him saying, what have I to do with thee, thou king of Judah? I come not against thee this day, but against the house wherewith I have war. For God commanded me to make haste, forbear thee from meddling with God who is with me, that he destroy thee not. Now, I personally believe that he's telling the truth, right? And if he wasn't telling the truth, then why did Josiah die? Okay, if Josiah was in the right here, then he wouldn't have died, okay? But I believe that he was meddling with strife, not belonging to him, and Pharaoh Necho was actually doing what God wanted him to do, okay? Which lines up with Isaiah 19, where we see Egypt actually serving God, and I believe Pharaoh Necho was one of those kings that was serving God. And Pharaoh Necho actually is the one that set up Jehoiakim, you know, uh, one of uh, Josiah's sons. So basically, uh, Egypt was kind of overseeing uh, Judah there for a little bit. And, uh, and obviously we know at that point that's when they're about to go into captivity from Babylon. Okay? And Egypt's being taken out and Judah's going to be taken out. All this stuff, right? So that being said, you know, I believe it's very clear when this is happening. Okay? And so that's kind of near future. And go to uh, Ezekiel chapter 29 because Ezekiel 29 this is very clear that this happens when Judah is in captivity, when it's talking about Egypt being taken out completely. Okay? And let's see what it says about that. Because we saw in Isaiah 19, what did it say? He's going to destroy it, right? He's going, going to smite it, is the way it says in the, in the chapter. He's going to smite and he's going to heal. Okay? Smite and heal. And then in Ezekiel, you know, Ezekiel 29 and verse 1 here, just to give you some timeline as far as where this is at, it says, in the 10th year, in the 10th month, in the 12th day of the month, okay, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying. Now, the way that Ezekiel's written is that when he says in the 10th year, he's talking about in the 10th year of captivity, okay? So it starts off in the 5th year of captivity when you start, when you start reading the book of Ezekiel. And so it's basically giving you a timeline of when God came to him, and it's based off when Judah was in captivity, okay? So in the 10th year of that captivity, captivity. It says in verse 2, Son of man, set thy face against Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and prophesy against him and against all Egypt. Speak and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, the great dragon that lieth in the midst of the rivers. Sound familiar? The seven-headed dragon. It says, Which hath said, My river is mine own, and I have made it for myself. Notice in verse 12. It says, And I will make the land of Egypt desolate in the midst of the countries that are desolate, and her cities among the cities that are laid waste shall be, shall be desolate forty years. And I will scatter the Egyptians among the nations, and I will disperse them through the countries. Yet thus, saith the Lord God, at the end of forty years will I gather the Egyptians from the people whither they, are, they were scattered. So you get the picture here? He's going to destroy it. It's going to be desolate for forty years. And then, after 40 years, he's going to uh, gather the Egyptians that were scattered. And it says, And I will bring again the captivity of Egypt, and will cause them to return into the land of Pathros, into the land of their habitation. And they shall be there a base kingdom. And it shall be the basest of the kingdoms. Neither shall it exalt itself any more above the nations, for I will diminish them, that they shall no more rule over the nations." A little different than the end of Isaiah 19, right? Because at the end of Isaiah 19, they were number two, I believe. I mean, at least number two. Okay, because it says that Israel was third to Egypt and Assyria. Okay? So a little different here because basically this is where Egypt is no more going to be a world power. 
is in at this time here. Notice what it says, and it, says, and it shall be no more the confidence of the house of Israel which bringeth their iniquity to remembrance when they shall look after them, but they shall know that I am the Lord God. And it shall come to pass in the seven and twentieth year in the first month. So this is when it happens. Okay, so the prophecy came to Ezekiel in the tenth year of captivity, but in the twenty-seventh year is when it happened. Okay, so if you know the story as far as um, you know, I mean, well, not to get into Nebuchadnezzar, but we'll get, that's another that's the rabbit trail. Um, but it says in the, 20, uh, the 7 20th year, in the first month, in the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, Nebuchadrezzar, king of Babylon, caused his army to, to serve a great service against Tyrus. Every head was made bald, and every shoulder was peeled. Yet had he no wages, his, or, nor his army, for Tyrus, for the service that he had severed, or I'm sorry, served against it. The, Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will give the land of Egypt unto Nebuchadrezzar, king of Babylon, and he shall take her multitude, and take her spoil, and take her prey, and it shall be the wages for his army. So it basically just goes on here, and this, this whole chapter is about, you know, basically the destruction of Egypt. But notice how that's a little different, right? I don't believe that's what Isaiah is talking about. I believe Isaiah is talking about a civil war that's breaking out in Egypt. And he's basically causing everything to just fall apart. You know, basically he's drying up the rivers. And then he's taking away wisdom from the leaders. And they, they had this fierce king. But ultimately, in the end, he's going to heal it. Okay? Now, in the case later on, he completely annihilates it. And this happens with Judah, right? Judah, he judges Judah. And then there's a good king that comes in. And I believe Pharaoh Necho was a good king. Okay? And I believe he was serving the Lord. He said God was with him. I don't believe he was lying. Now, if he would have died in battle and Josiah would have prevailed, then, you know, it says the sword of the Lord and of Josiah or something like that, you know, then I'd be like, all right, maybe Pharaoh and Eco wasn't, you know, serving God, okay? Because Rapshiki says, the Lord has said unto me, you know, <laughs> and, it, and it basically talking about uh, that we're going to take this city and all this stuff. And so Rapshiki obviously was lying, and that wasn't true. Um, but I believe Pharaoh Necho was, you know, serving the Lord, and Josiah was just meddling with stuff he should have been meddling with, and ultimately died because of that. Um, but go, to, go back to Isaiah chapter 19. Isaiah chapter 19. And again, this is where I believe it's showing you, hey, you know, God was judging Egypt. He judged it harshly. But then he healed it. And so even Egypt could turn around for the Lord. And I know today, you know, we look at America and we think, you know, there's no hope. And, you know, the end is near. And it very well could be. Okay? But you got to think about history here. Think about that you were in the Middle Ages, right? The Catholic Church is literally beheading Christians. And people were being burned at the stake for having a Bible they could read. Don't you think they thought it was the end at that point? I mean, we're not at that point yet. Okay. And so what I'm saying with this is that, yes, we should prepare for the worst. We need to prepare for, you know, the end. Okay. But I want to be optimistic and say, hey, you know what? I want to be a Josiah. Why can't we turn this country around for just maybe another 40 years? Okay. Just think about it, how long did Josiah reign? I mean, it wasn't that long. I think it was like 30-some years or something like that. And uh, I think it was 31, if, but I, I'm forgetting. I get my chart, but you get the point. It wasn't that long that he reigned. And even, even Hezekiah didn't reign that long, right? Hezekiah reigned. It was good reign. And then you had Manasseh that reigned actually for 52 years, right? So it was like, what in the world? <laughs> Why is he reigning so long? And then Ammon only reigned for a, you know, a year or so or whatever. And then Josiah jumped in. And so, you know what? We need to be looking at it and say, you know what? I'm going to stay the hand of God for another 20 years, for another 40 years, for my lifetime at least, right? And you know what? It may come in our days. It may, it, it's inevitable. Don't get me wrong, okay? And I'm not saying that, like, that generation of Christians, as far as there's not going to be anybody that's going to be serving the Lord or fighting against it at that time, you know, I don't believe that for a second, because how in the world is the gospel going to be preached to the whole, everyone in the, the whole world if that was the case? This Laodicean age garbage is, is just that. 
But what I'm saying with this is that we need to prepare for the worst, but fight for the best. Okay? Meaning this is that we should have on our mind and say, you know what? I'm going to win as many people to Christ. I'm going to try to get as many people into the Bible. And I'm going to try to get people back on the side of God. And it starts in the house of God. Okay? It starts with us and the fact that, hey, we need to go out and preach the gospel to others. We need to go out and try to bring them in, try to teach them to do likewise. And you know what? We need to not just be a negative Nancy all the time. Okay? Like I said, prepare for the worst. Be prepared for it, right? It's like when you go into the DMV. You got to be prepared. You know, I wish someone would just punch me in the face before I went in there, and then I'd be prepared for whatever I had to deal with in there. Same thing with the tribulation, right? You need to be prepared to be like, hey, it, it's going to be bad. We need to, to be prepared for that mentally, physically, everything, right? But ultimately, you should be saying, listen, but I'm going to try to stay the hand of God. I'm going to try to, to turn this country around so that it, it could serve God. And even Egypt had a time where they were serving God for a little bit. And that should make you think something. I mean, I'm sure in Joseph's day that they weren't that bad, right? When Joseph was second in command, right? But then there, was the, there came a, a leader or a king that didn't know Joseph, right? And that's when things went bad. So we need to be thinking in those, those aspects. Now go to the verse 16 there. It says, in, the day, in that day shall Egypt be like unto women. Oh, man, did the Bible just... You know, say something that's not on the feminist agenda. Let's see what he means by that. It says that Egypt's going to be like unto women. Well, I guess they're going to be strong, brave. You know, they're going to be, they can do whatever men can do, right? They're going to be like unto women, and it, shall, and it shall be afraid and fear because of the shaking of the hand of the Lord of hosts, which it, he shaketh over it. So what's it like in, you know, being like unto women, right? And there's other places in the Bible where it talks about this, and it's talking about them being afraid, okay? And, you know, I hate to say this. Actually, I don't hate to say this because this is what the Bible teaches, and it's just fact, okay? Women are the weaker vessel. Women are not to be going into war, okay? They're not made. God did not make women to be able to fight actual physical battles. And what it's stating here is that the Egyptians, their heart were like women in battle. That's what it turned into be, you know, turned out to be. Okay? And what does that mean? Because they're the weaker vessel. That means they became weak. They became afraid. Okay? And that's not popular today, right? Because women can barely do everything that a man can do, even though it's scientifically illiterate to say something like that. Just a fact of anatomy. Okay? Men are stronger than women. Fact. Okay? Men and women are different. There's only two genders. Fact. Okay? And the Bible here is stating the fact that, hey, they were like women. You know in, the, you know in uh, Revelation when it says that the locusts are going to have hair like women? I wonder why it says that. Maybe because nature itself teaches us that a man should not have long hair. That's a shame unto a man and that the, the hair of women is a glory unto them. And that the Bible literally says that the hair is going to be like women and it doesn't say that it's long, but you're supposed to connect the two, right? What does it mean when their hair is like women? You know, does it mean that it's braided and it's pretty? You know, it means it's long, okay? That's what it means. It just means that they have long hair like women have long hair, okay? And when it says that they're going to be like women, what does that mean? They're going to be weak physically, okay? And here's the thing. This doesn't mean that women are weak-minded or that women are weak or that they're lesser value. It's just that men and women are different. And if you were to choose, okay, let's say there was a platoon of people that wanted to kill you that were coming over that hill right there, would you choose 10 men or 10 women to go with you in the battle? Should, I mean, that should be a no-brainer, right? 10 men every day do I want to go into the trenches in battle, okay? And that's just common sense, but that's, that's scientifically accurate, right? The fact that they're stronger, you know, and, and just the mindset of men, okay? The mindset of men are going to be more harsh, okay? And so it's going to be more calloused to that type of, you know, realm, okay? And so anyway, going on from that, as I was just going from there, that was, that was a commercial break on 
you know, society today thinking men and women are the same, okay? Now, in verse 17 there, it says, and the, and the land of Judah shall be a terror unto Egypt. Every one that maketh mention thereof shall be afraid in himself because of the counsel of the Lord of hosts, which he hath determined against it. So it's basically saying, listen, they're going to be afraid of the land of Judah. Okay? So if you think about this, you know, obviously the land of Judah is where God's temple's at. This is where his people are at. And he's making Egypt, who's a major power, afraid of that nation because that's where the council of the Lord's at. Okay? Notice in verse 18 it says, In that day shall five cities in the land of Egypt speak the language of Canaan and swear to the Lord of hosts. Notice it. Now, what does it mean by this in, in context, right? Where is Judah? In the land of Canaan, right? They took, out, they took over Canaan. That's where Israel's at. Canaan is now Israel, right? So it's basically saying they're speaking that language, okay? One shall be called the city of destruction. So it's basically saying five cities in the land of Egypt are going to be speaking that language, and one of those cities is going to now be called the city of destruction, okay? And notice in verse 19, it says, In that day shall there be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt, and a pillar at the border thereof to the Lord. And it shall be for a sign and for a witness unto the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt. For they shall cry unto the Lord because of the oppressors, and he shall send them a Savior and a great one, and he shall deliver them. I mean, you would think he was talking about Israel right here, wouldn't you? He's talking about Egypt. He's saying Egypt is going to set up this altar and this pillar, and they're dedicating it to it, and they're even going to speak that language. And then he's going to send them a Savior, a great one, a deliverer, okay? And it says, and the Lord shall be known to Egypt, and the Egyptians shall know the Lord in that day, and shall do sacrifice and oblation. Yea, they shall vow a vow unto the Lord and perform it. You know, all my years of reading through Isaiah and, you know, hearing Isaiah, I've never really parked it here and just thought about this passage. On the fact that there was a time where Egypt was literally sacrificing to the true God. They were actually serving the true God. Now, I believe this is a small portion in history where they're doing this, right? But there was a time when they were serving God. And listen, this isn't just something, you know, that that's the only time some other nation did this, okay? Even in New Testament, there's been nations that serve God. Think about the Byzantine, you know, empire. You think of, like, where were all the churches at? Where were the churches that uh, Revelation was written to? Modern-day Turkey. Okay? That's where the Byzantine Empire was at. And that's where all the Greek New Testaments you know, and the transcripts came from where we got our Texas Receptus. Okay? But then there's also other branches and other countries that were propagating the gospel or purporting the gospel. And, they were, and there were certain times in history where like, the Mongolian Empire was Christian. You know there was a time when England was Christian? <laughs> right? You're like, it's atheist now. But see, that, 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 that can move and that can change. And, and the same thing you know, with, with America. America used to be known as a Christian nation. Now they want you to think that it's not a Christian nation, or, even though most people would claim to be Christian in America. But the idea is that you know, even a wicked country can turn to the Lord for at least a period of time there. And it also shows you that, hey, you know what? This is Old Testament, and people of other countries were serving God. Now, in the Old Testament, unfortunately, you know, if you want to do certain feasts, you had to go to Jerusalem, right? So you had to do the Passover at Jerusalem, and you had to do different things at Jerusalem. There are certain things you had to do. You had to be circumcised to be a part of that nation, to do certain things, right? But that didn't mean that you couldn't be of another nation and be saved and still, you know, love God and, you know, even do sacrifices unto him, right? And so, in, uh, go to uh, Romans chapter 15, Romans chapter 15, because this is all over the Old Testament as far as this goes. Now, what people want you to think is that, well, it was only in the New Testament that he actually cared about the Gentiles. Okay? That's the mindset. That's the dispensational mindset. Okay? Is that people of other nations, God only cared about them, you know, after the Jews rejected them. Okay? <laughs> but, listen... The Gentiles and the, the, the salvation going to the Gentiles was not plan B. It wasn't like, oh, the Jews rejected me? Oh, man, what are we going to do now? I guess the Gentiles. No, it's always been that, you know, look unto me, 
all of the earth, all the earth, right? All the world, look unto me and be ye saved. And so it's always been everybody. God wants everybody to be saved. And that's not just a New Testament doctrine. But in Romans chapter 15, and verse 8 here, Romans chapter 15, verse 8, I, I believe really explains, you know, why Jesus came and, and devoted about three or so years to his, his, his own people, if you will, that, that fleshly speaking, right? Uh, you know, that, to whom the oracles of God were given and the promises were given, that he spent those, those three, three to three and a half years with them, but then it was ultimately knowing that they're going to reject it, but it's kind of like, you know what, you're going to be without excuse. Notice in verse 8, it says, Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the Father. So why was he a minister unto the circumcision? To confirm the promises. Okay. Now, didn't other people get saved that weren't of Israel during that time? Yeah. But that wasn't his main focus, right? It'd be like if we spent three years and be like, you know what, we're going to spend three years on this one location right here. Does that mean we don't? if someone else came to us to get saved, we're just like, no, you can't get it. You know, it's not we're just focused on this one area, right, at that point. But notice in verse 9 there, it says, and that, notice this, and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. It wasn't that, well, I didn't want it. Plan B, everybody, you know. No, the reason that he confirmed the promises with the fathers, it says, is so that, right, or and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, for this cause I will confess thee among the Gentiles and sing unto thy name. And again he said, rejoice ye Gentiles with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all ye Gentiles, and laud him, all ye people. And again, Isaiah said, there shall be a root of Jesse, and he, sh he that shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, in him shall the Gentiles trust. And I love this passage because he's like, and again, and again. And again, and again, it's always been the fact that it was, you know, for everybody. Salvation's always been for everybody. Obviously, in the Old Testament with Moses and the law, you know, there was, you know, dietary laws and all this stuff, and you know, it was pointing and picturing a lot of things, but people were always able to join that if they wanted to. And people could get saved in any nation, and any nation could say, you know what, I'm going to serve God. And guess what? Egypt did it for a little period of time. And... Um, notice, uh, you know, just kind of the correlation, too, with how this could picture, you know, because you can see how, you know, he'll send them a savior, a deliverer, how that could picture the first coming, you know, of Christ, right? I'll send you a savior because I'm, you know, he's sending Jesus to save not only his own, but all Gentiles, right? Everybody. Because he's the lamb saved from the foundation of the world, first of all. That salvation was available from the foundation of the world. But he didn't just come to die for the Jews. He came to die for everybody. And, you know, in that passage, um, you know, I also see the second coming of Christ. And that's what I mostly see in this passage. Because in verse 22 of Isaiah 19, it says, And the Lord shall smite Egypt, he shall smite and heal it, and they shall return even to the Lord, and he shall be entreated of them and shall heal them. Okay. That reminds me of Revelation just so much. Now, go to Revelation chapter 11. Revelation chapter 11. Because he's going to smite Babylon, right? And he's going to smite all the nations. But there's going to be some people that survive, right? He doesn't kill everybody. It's only a percentage that he kills. He, and in the Battle of Armageddon, which, you know, you could also look at the fact of where was, uh, where was Josiah killed? Megiddo, which is the Valley of Megiddo, and you think of the Valley of Decision, we haven't got to that part yet, but uh, the Battle of Armageddon, all that stuff's kind of linked there. But the idea, though, is that there's people that are going to survive, that are going to serve the Lord, that are going to turn and actually glorify God. And I want to show you that. This is at the very end of the sixth trumpet, okay? So Revelation chapter 11 and verse 13, and we're dealing with Jerusalem, okay? And which is called spiritually what? Sodom and Egypt. Okay, and notice what it says about this right before the seventh trumpet's blown. It says in verse 13, it says, In the same hour, so the same hour that the two prophets, you know, were caught up into heaven, uh, it says, The same hour was there a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell. And in the earthquake were slain of men 7,000. So 7,000 people die. And it says, 
and the remnant were affrighted and gave glory to the God of heaven. So you see here, right even before the seventh trumpet is blown, you have people, I believe, fearing God and giving glory to him. And when the everlasting gospel comes down in Revelation chapter 14, what does it say? Fear God and give him glory. Now I'm kind of paraphrasing because I'm, I might be misquoting that a little bit. But he's bringing down the everlasting gospel and saying, fear God and give him the glory. So when you preach someone the gospel, say, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, what do they need to do? Fear God and give him the glory, right? They need to fear God in the fact that their punishment for their sin is hell, and they need to give him the glory by believing on him that he's the one that actually is going to save you from their sins, or from, from your sins. And that being said is that I believe these people get saved right here, okay? Now, you know, right after that, notice what it says in verse 14. It says, that the second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. So this is where Jesus is basically taking authority. Okay, now there's stuff that has to happen, right? Babylon's going to be destroyed, but that only takes one hour, by the way. <laughs> right? Because when the seventh trumpet sounds, the seventh vials poured out, and it says Babylon's brought into remembrance, and it says they are destroyed in one hour. <laughs> okay? And before this, in the sixth vial, the, everybody's already gathering to this Battle of Armageddon, okay? So everything's kind of being set up for this point, and then you have the Battle of Armageddon, okay? So stuff's going on, but Jesus is reigning at that point. You know, he is king at that point. And, you know, there's a battle, but ultimately we know that it's just getting snuffed out like that, okay? There's, there's no more time of the, the, the Gentiles. There's no more time of the Antichrist. It is the time of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's going to rule and reign for a thousand years, and then he's going to lift up the kingdom to the Father and, you know, rule and reign forever. That's the, the end game. And go to Zephaniah chapter 3, and I know I've kind of hit on this as far as that goes, as far as the, the thousand year reign. You could look at Isaiah 2. You could look at Micah 4, dealing with that. Those are parallel passages dealing with how um, it talks about how uh, all nations are going to flow unto Jerusalem, unto that holy mountain. And it talks about how, and many people shall go and say, we will walk in his paths, right? So this just screams this passage, okay? Now, I, like I said, I know this is something that happened already long ago, but it, I believe it's paralleling what's going to happen at the very end when these nations are judged. They're going to all, there's going to be a remnant of people that's going to survive out of that and they're going to flow on to Jesus, and they're going to, they're going to you know, serve the Lord, and you know, he's, you know, we're going to be rolling the rain for a thousand years, but there's going to be you know, regular human people that are still living and dying during that time. Okay? In Zephaniah chapter 3 and verse 9, it says, For then will I turn to the people a pure language, that they may all call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one consent. Sound familiar? That there's five cities in Egypt... And they all spoke the language of Canaan, which is where Judah was at, which is where Jerusalem was at. Okay? And so I think that's giving you a little insight about the thousand year reign that people are all gonna there's gonna be a lingua franca at least, right? Meaning that there might be other languages still, but it's not gonna be a matter of like there's gonna be a language that everybody knows. Okay. And so uh, and then it says, From beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my suppliants, even the daughter of my dispersed, shall bring mine offering. In that day shall there be not be ashamed, <clears throat> I'm sorry, thou shalt not be ashamed for all thy doings, wherein thou hast transgressed against me. So notice that these people have done wrong, right? So it's kind of like they've, they've done wrong, but it says, For then I will take away out of the midst of them that rejoice in thy pride. So they're basically taking out all the people of pride out of the midst of them. Sound familiar with all the people that take the mark of the beast, all that? And thou shalt no more be haughty because of my holy mountain. I will also leave in the midst of thee an afflicted and poor people, and they shall trust in the name of the Lord. And I believe that's exactly what happens at the very end. And, and I believe that that's pretty much what happened with, with Egypt in chapter 19 here, where basically God judged them, caused them to have civil war amongst each other, took away their wisdom, and ultimately healed them, though. He brought them a savior. It doesn't really tell us exactly what happened there, right? And I, I'm not a history buff, and I don't even know if the history books even know about all this or would even know what happened here, okay? A lot of time, history is catching up to the Bible anyway, right? But that being said, I believe that, you know, the physical application, you know, outside of, you know, end times prophecy is that, you know, 
They had civil war, a cruel and fierce king was set up among them. All this stuff was going to pot. And ultimately, eventually, he sent them a savior. He sent them a deliverer to deliver them out of that. And they became a righteous nation that served God. That's what I believe happened here. And it's a very interesting story. It's one of those stories that you could read through this really quick and be like, oh, you know, okay. You know? <laughs> and you're not really thinking about like, what really happened. But that's a pretty awesome story, in my opinion. You know, and the fact of Egypt actually serving God for a little bit of time. And I believe that links up with Pharaoh and Nico in the end there. So, um, so interesting chapter. Chapter 20 is going to be really interesting. It's a short chapter, but there's definitely some interesting stuff in there. Um, but uh, anyway, so we're going to continue our studying Lord willing next week. And so that's Isaiah chapter 19. Let's end with a word of prayer today. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. And just pray that you be with us throughout the rest of this week. Again, I pray that you be with Miss Ruth with uh, delivery tomorrow. And just those that are traveling, uh, many that are traveling in our church, Lord. Just pray that you keep us healthy, Lord, with uh, viruses and just sicknesses going around. Just pray that you keep our church healthy. And Lord, just uh, protect the families in this church. Lord, we love you. I pray also in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.